Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to this monthly webinar organized by the NIA. Today's topic is antimicrobial treatment, and uh, we will dive in into, into the topic in just a moment, but I wanted to take a minute uh, before that to introduce NIA and what we do. We're an industry organization based in Brussels with offices in Switzerland, the UK and the Netherlands. And our mission is to support the successful development and commercialization of nanomaterials. In order to do that, we support our members with understanding what kind of uh, regulatory requirements they have to comply with in order to safely bring their products to the market. We provide the information that uh, users need to have confidence in the nanomaterials performance and safety. And we support uh, connections between the different parts of the supply chain so that uh, our members can find the right customers and applications for their materials. We do this by uh, supporting the development of a stable and predictable regulatory framework we promote opportunities for networking and visibility for our members, and we help the establishment of the global ecosystem. And we look at really all the parts of the different nanotechnology environment, which is why our members are not just the producers and the users of nanomaterials, but also the providers of those collateral products and services like lab equipment, but also regulatory advice, as well as a number of research organizations, as well as universities. In terms of the regulatory and policy activities, we follow chemical legislation and standardization activities, not just in the EU, but globally. We look at uh, the hot topics of safe and sustainable by design, safe innovation, advanced materials, and obviously how trade evolution reflects and affects the global commercial commercial aspect of nanomaterials. And we uh, obviously do not do this just by ourselves, but we engage with a number of institutional and civil society stakeholders, again, in the EU and globally. If you want to uh, get involved with NIA activities, you are of course following today's webinar, but you can also join our very link active LinkedIn community and participate in uh, events and uh, trade shows where we have uh, where we participate. Uh, and you can also follow the specific projects that we are uh, partners of on topics of innovation and safety for nanomaterials. Um, there are two projects that have started this year, iCare and Nanopass, that are not yet on the slide because they do not have a logo yet. Uh, but you should definitely uh, have a look at the NIA website if you want to learn more on those as well. So how to get involved? Uh, if you have received information about this event, you probably already registered for our newsletter. If that is not the case, it only takes a couple of minutes to rectify that. You can also, as I mentioned, join our LinkedIn and Twitter community. And of course, if you're interested in uh, getting involved at a deeper level, you can also uh, join us as a member. As I mentioned earlier, we have membership models that cover pretty much any type of organization. So if you are interested in discussing that more in detail, uh, my contact details are on the slides, which you will receive after the event today. Now, let's jump in. Uh, so we will first look at setting the scene and what are the uh, key points to keep in mind when we're talking about surface antimicrobial surface treatment. We will then have concrete examples of nano-based applications for that. And then we will look at how one can assess the effectiveness of uh, antimicrobial treatment. So with that in mind, we can start. Um, now, the last couple of years have really brought to the attention of the broader public a challenge that those who manage uh, spaces open to the public already had in mind, uh, and that is how to keep high touch surfaces safe for the public. It is somewhat ironic that this has come through the COVID-19 pandemic because we now have enough data to know that surface transmission for this specific uh, 
uh, infection is not actually uh, a particularly important route of transmission, uh, being an airborne disease. But uh, coronaviruses are obviously not the only pathogens that can be transmitted uh, through surface contact. And so uh, in terms of treatment of surfaces, there are different uh, degrees of, let's say, aggressiveness uh, in which to treat them. Uh, starting with cleaning, uh, which is defined simply as the act of removing dirt from that specific surface. One step further is sanitizing, which is the reduction of the number of pathogens on that surface to save levels, which are defined as the removal or killing of 99.9 .9 or 99 for uh, food contact surfaces of a number of pathogens. And then there is disinfection, where pathogens, uh, at least 99.999% needs to be killed. Now, the uh, American National Restaurant Association uh, provides a serve safe certification to those establishments that serve food to the public. And in their guidelines, cleaning and sanitizing are two steps of a process that they recommend be repeated at least every four hours for those items that are in constant use. And so cleaning or is the first step, that is the application of the cleaning agent, so a detergent or soap and water, which should then be rinsed again with water. Then the application of the disinfecting or sanitizing product, uh, which should then not be rubbed or wiped, but let to dry. And we will come back to the importance of this step uh, further in this presentation. Now, for public transport, of course, every public transport company has adopted slightly different approaches over the last few years, but I have uh, chosen to quote the uh, guidelines developed by the American Public Transport Association as an example of uh, what public transport companies have had to adopt uh, in, their, uh, in, their, in the running of their operations in the last few years. So the APTA recommends that the facilities and vehicles uh, available to the public be cleaned and disinfected daily. And in addition, for those vehicles like buses that are operated in shifts, every time a shift concludes, the vehicle should be uh, cleaned at least in its high touch surfaces. So that would be uh, door handles, buttons, seats, steering wheel, and so on. Um, now, the, in addition to this, both facilities and vehicles should undergo uh, a deep cleaning at least once a week. For In terms of products that should be used for these activities, cleaning uh, should be done with either soap and water or detergents, and the disinfecting part should be done with pesticides that have been approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, these chemicals uh, can be used, uh, some of them can be used actually for both sanitizing and disinfecting depending on the concentration. So uh, you're probably familiar with most of the, of the ones mentioned in this list. And I think things like alcohol, chlorine in its uh, uh, bleach form and hydrogen peroxide are probably chemicals that we all have in our households, hopefully stored safely away from children. Um, that is because uh, disinfectants uh, work by destroying the cell walls of a pathogen and damaging its proteins through oxidation. So this is obviously quite an aggressive uh, process. Uh, and then it follows that other organisms that come into contact with these chemicals can also uh, experience negative effects, which is the first and most important challenge for those uh, managing spaces open to the public that need to carry out sanitizing and disinfecting protocols. There is an exposure risk for both the staff carrying out the cleaning and disinfecting, but also for the public. So these products can create skin and eye irritation. Uh, if inhaled, they can trigger asthma or allergy episodes, especially in people with a pre-existing respiratory condition. And uh, they can also have noxious effects in terms of long-term exposure. 
There are also effects on the environment. Uh, already in September of 2020, the Forestry Bureau in Chongqing in southwest China reported that they had linked the death of about 100 animals across different uh, 17 different species to the uh, effects of the release of massive quantities of disinfecting agents in the environment. Um, and uh, National Geographic has also run a few articles and dedicated part of a documentary on precisely the topic of the effects on urban wildlife of the increased use of disinfectants. Although uh, precise data on this is still being collected, so we do not know at present with certainty what effects on the environment can be. Another effect that has been reported and on which there is more data is that of bacterial resistance. Because if disinfecting agents are not applied correctly, uh, they not only will not be effective in killing pathogens, but they will also uh, risk developing bacterial resistance. So uh, when I mentioned earlier the serve safe certification, uh, the National uh, Restaurant Association uh, uh, provides a, a fourth step of uh, air dry of the disinfecting agent for precisely that reason, because uh, for being effective, certain disinfectants need what is called dwell time. So they need to stay on contact with the surface without being wiped or rubbed away. Then there are some uh, specific challenges for public transportation authorities in terms of the chemicals that they choose and the vehicles that they need to apply those chemicals to. Because when we think of alcohol-based disinfectants, they are quite effective. But it is one thing to store alcohol-based disinfectants at a bus deposit and use it on the vehicles that come back at the end of the shift. It is quite another thing to store them to treat underground vehicles like subway cars, for instance, because of the flammability and explosion, explosion danger. Uh, and so in some cases, for instance, um, public transportation authorities would not be able to use these chemicals because that would be contravening safety regulation about having alcohol stored in the underground facilities. Um, anecdotally for alcohol, there are also reports of episodes of vandalism. Um, there is a, a, a town in Massachusetts where last December uh, it was reported that hand sanitizers uh, dispenser had been set on fire. And finally, even if everything goes to plan and the sanitation is carried out correctly with no uh, harmful effects on staff and the public, this obviously generates additional costs. So here in Brussels, where the NIA offices are based, the public transportation company uh, estimated that in 2021, they had to add 22 and a half million of euros to their budget to cover the increased costs related to the sanitation protocols that they are carrying out. Just to put that into context, 27 million was the amount that they spent in the same year on energy costs. So this can add quite considerably to uh, a company's running costs. And that is why alternative solutions have also been explored. So in terms of other inactivating agents that can be used uh, for surface treatment, uh, ultraviolet light has been looked at, although that comes with its own set of cost and challenges. And then biocidal surface materials, as well as films and coatings have been explored. Uh, this is a field in which the healthcare sector has already uh, made considerable advancements. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude this first part and introduce our next speaker for today. So uh, Eldara Rodriguez Cobo is Innovation Manager at Nanogap and an NIA board member. So we're very happy to welcome you to the event, Eldara. And whenever you're ready, you can share your slides and unmute yourself. Welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody, to attend and, of course, to NIA to 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 come with us uh, for for this for this interesting webinar. I'm going to switch up the camera and but I and I will share a screen. Just let me know if you find some problems. Uh, sorry. Uh, We can see your screen now, thank you. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, I will just... Okay, so um, I am Eldara Rodriguez. I am Innovation Manager of NanoGap. We are a nanomaterials company based in, in Spain. And okay, I would like to, to show you one of the thing, one of the applications that we have in our portfolio of nanomaterials and metal molecules, in this case, metal molecules for antimicrobial surface treatment. Um, Okay, first of all, I would like to introduce just uh, a little bit uh, what we do and where, uh, where we do and everything. Nanogap uh, application portfolio has, is based on a, on a technology platform based on metal molecules, which are sub-nanometer clusters of just a few atoms with unique and tunable properties. These, uh, these metal molecules and these, uh, these uh, applications uh, lead us to have a wide range of high value, high growth markets to access to them, including catalyst, clean hydrogen and cancer treatment. So we have a diverse portfolio with uh, short, medium and long term opportunities. The, everything is, uh, is based on a strong intellectual property and freedom to operate with 12 patents, active patents right now, uh, with more than the 70% granted. And we have major commercial contracts in place, which, mean that, which means that we have demonstrated commercial demand. Uh, our business strategy uh, start with uh, new applications for these metal molecules and also for nanoparticles, bigger counterparts, um, that are developed uh, with uh, low res lower resources compared with the other steps um, in, a, in a research basic research uh, laboratory. When the application is mature enough to reach uh, to to reach um, a specific market and to get through different clients, because we found that we find that different clients will be interested in that, that application. We put it in the business, business unit, which means to put much more effort and to invest, uh, to put more resources on this application. And the final goal, the final objective, if possible, because it's not the case in, uh, uh, for every application, is to, is to, um, to create a spin-off. This is a way to maximize the value and also to be sure that uh, every application is lead and is managed for people that, that are uh, um, experts on the different areas because we know a lot of our materials how to produce it how to apply them but it's really difficult to know about every market that we can find for for our products um, it's important for us always to explain what metal molecules are. You can see here a, a diagram with nanoparticles, large clusters, and small clusters. And the clusters, the small clusters, which the metal molecules that we are working with are clusters of just a few atoms inside. They are very stable. Um, although they are form of metal elements, they have no metallic properties. This can be seen uh, easily in this diagram. Uh, uh, while a nanoparticle of around 10 nanometers is, uh, is composed of a core and a shell, and the core is mainly uh, has the same properties as the bulk, um, and the, spe uh, the special properties of the nanoparticle compared with the bulk are due to surface uh, effects. Uh, due to the atoms that are on the surface. In the case of, lar of large clusters, um, the it, um, there is a separation on the energy levels, which lead to discrete um, electronic states. So the electrons are confined. And then, uh, but in this case, the separation between the, the energy levels is not high enough 
to be uh, as stable as the small clusters. In this case, the homo-lumo uh, gap is really high. So there is no core shear structure at all because all the atoms are on the surface and there is no need for binding uh, with a strong uh, stabilizing agents. So um, this bang gap structure with confined electrons give us a really interesting and new unique size dependent properties. So just changing one or two or three atoms of the cluster will change the properties. Uh, to semiconductor, thermocatalytic, electrocatalytic, photocatalytic, antimicrobial, or therapeutic applications. So uh, behind uh, all the applications of the metal molecules, there is the, the same mechanism, which is a, a catalytic process. So we are uh, able to manufacture by a scalable accused methods using low-cost raw materials, this kind of uh, materials. So there is no need to use a uh, rare earth or uh, strange materials that are not common, uh, which will lead to a, a reduce the cost of every application. By other side, um, they are really stable at high temperatures. So you can work with them or work with materials uh, and do different steps like sintering or uh, temperature treatment or whatever treatment, uh, keeping the, the properties of the materials. Um, the typical catalyst support such alumina, silicon, zirconia can be used to prepare dry support catalysis, catalyst. In this case, it would be more for apl applications in energy, energy or uh, chemical catalysis. And the naked surface of these metal molecules allows for further fine tuning of the catalytic properties. With the through the interaction of these atoms of the surface of the of the metal molecule with the support. Uh, one thing that is really important for um, most of the application that we find for the clusters is the the great uh, temperature stability of this metal molecule, because they they come they are uh, temperature stable and they may be sensitive to the substrate onto which they are support. So depending of the substrate that we put it, we can reach up to 900 degrees. Uh, with um, this could be with uh, supports like alumina or titania. The case is that you can apply these clusters. You can uh, do any material like a polymer or or a stone or whatever, and you can do you can do you can perform a temperature treatment without losing the activity. So, which are which are the challenges and so on the opportunities in the antimicrobial treatment. By one side, there is a need uh, for the release control, for not losing the antimicrobial or antiviral or, or the, um, the um, agent that you have in the surface. Also, to prevent the environmental release is important to the release control. It's also uh, important the long-term stability which will mean uh, that you can use and reuse the, the, the material, the antimicrobial treatment, without having to renew it. And also, it's really interesting the multi multifunctionality, being able of, uh, with one compound, uh, have a surf uh, intelligent surface, which will have different types of, of applications. In this case, with the mol metal molecules are non-toxic for uh, normal cells, so they are not toxic for human. Uh, the mechanism of, of action is catalytic, so there is and there is no migration of the of the metal molecule. The metal molecule is attached to the surface. Uh, wherever it is, and then will not move from there. And as it acts um, as a catalyst, um, it, it will be not consumed. It could, you can use it for a, a long period of time. By other side, these metal molecules, just changing uh, maybe the metal and me or, or the number of atoms, uh, we can find different applications such antimicrobial activity, antiviral activity, and also for self-cleaning surfaces. 
The, then, uh, which, as I mentioned before, with this catalytic mechanism, we can get antimicrobial and antiviral surfaces. We can do uh, enhanced self-cleaning materials, and also we can apply antibacterial uh, medic to antimaterial antibacterial medical devices. I, I will not go into much detail with this, but uh, to better understand the catalytic mechanism, uh, I will say that uh, there is no universal mechanism of action for all the metal molecules. It depends a lot on the size and the type of the metal molecules. But there are two main bi biological actions that we know now. One is that the infected cells uh, are under oxidative stress, so they are not healthy and they can be attacked for the, uh, with, the, uh, to the, with the metal molecules or also the direct oxidation of the virus or viruses or the bacteria. Um, metal molecules are highly active for the irreversible oxidation of tiles at root temperature through the reactive oxygen species. So they can react with the tile groups of proteins and also the virus or, or bacteria membranes. So for the surface treatment, treatment uh, the, um, the advantages of, of these metal molecules are uh, are that they are non-migratory, they are permanent and effective at very low um, addition level, which is a really huge advantage if you compare to the sil common antibacterial sil uh, silver compounds used. And this is due to the catalytic mechanism. We just need a small amount to get the highest uh, reaction. They can be used for the treatment of multiple surfaces, including plastics, glass, wood, metal, and stone. Uh, so the application will include a lot of things like tabletops, floors, walls, and screens in public spaces, uh, as well as public transport, hospital, medical devices. Uh, here I, can I would like to show you some uh, preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, results for the antimicrobial treatment of medical devices. In this case, metal molecules can be applied on the surface of the medical devices, such as catheter, uh, imparting the antimicrobial properties. The good thing is that they are so small, so there is no change in the optical properties. So it will just act as, as anti, anti, antimicrobial, but not will not change the other properties of the material. They can be formulated both in water or in acrylate. So it's, it's depending on the in the final application, uh, one form of another could be interesting. And they are really effective at PPM levels. So they can be used in catheters. Here, uh, bacterial contamination of catheters is, is a huge problem in, in the hospitals. And as you can see here, the activity, the inhibition show by these doses of uh, metal molecules of silver uh, against the Staphylococcus aureus uh, is up to 100%, which was a really good uh, result. Another application uh, that we have tested is uh, for the self-cleaning of surface. In this case, we have shown that with a low dose of, uh, of uh, copper-5 uh, metal molecules, we were able to, to degrade methylene blue, which is an organic molecule, so a target to, to, higiene, uh, to clean some type of surface. So you can see here the change of the methylene blue that when it's oxidized, lose the color. Uh, and for using this, we just need the visible light and it's reusable, so no post-treatment is needed for a surface. They can be used uh, for a long uh, time. Here uh, is just summarized the results for the different surface that we have tested. By one side here, if the coated PET films are the same as the, uh, the catheters that I showed you before. But here you can see that we use 
also uh, successfully for paper banknotes, which is something very common to put some treatments for the banknotes that are changing, uh, exchanging hands during their life, and also in granite surface, in a stone face. So, and the activity and the killing that we found, it was really, really nice um, against different, uh, different uh, organisms. Just to finalize, I want to point out that even though uh, nanotechnology uh, can lead us to a very uh, disruptive and really interesting applications in different areas, and in this case, in the antimicrobial treatments or surface, uh, and they could be a, really a solution. One of the main problems that we face and the challenge to the commercialization is always the, the regulatory approval. Uh, in our case, the metal molecules, the AQCs are, are a new material as it happens with a lot of nanomaterials. So, and regulatory approval processes are really long and expensive. We are, we are now just exploring funding opportunities to get this because for a SME like us, it's difficult to face with, with this challenge. And thank you very much. And if you have any question, I think that uh, Chiara will open the questions later. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Hildara. And indeed, we, we do know that uh, getting regulatory approval is a big hurdle uh, for SMEs. So uh, there might be questions about that in a moment. Um, I would now uh, would like to give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. James Redfern, who is Senior Lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I see your video is on and you're, you're still on mute but whenever you're ready to start, the floor is yours. We can see your slides. Great, yeah, that, okay, you can see that fine. Yeah, all good. Great, um, so I'm gonna also turn my camera off just uh, for bandwidth reasons, I suppose. Um, but hello everybody. Yeah, so my name is James Redfern. I'm a microbiology academic at Manchester Met in the UK. And I um, come from this from a microbiology point of view. So I'm not in any favor of any particular antimicrobial surface or treatment or any particular method. But I'm very much interested in standardized test methods for antimicrobial surfaces. So I'm coming from the point of view of if you have an antimicrobial material, how can we make sure that when you are talking about it and when you're trying to sell this product and you're going to the regulators, to the BPR, um, you can be certain that your antimicrobial surface is doing what, what you hope it, it should be doing. So um, I'm just going to talk you through some ideas, really, and, and tell you a little bit about what we've been up to um, in the last few years. But as we just heard, a really nice example, um, essentially antimicrobial surfaces are really useful for people because we've got lots of reasons why we might want to control microorganisms on surfaces and that predominantly is due to health. So we don't want to spread pathogens from one place to another and people, particularly human touch, um, is a real problem in terms of touching something that's got a nasty microorganism and then moving it to somewhere else or touching somebody else and giving somebody an infection. And so there's a lot of interest now in antimicrobial surfaces for that purpose. Um, particularly when we start to think about biofilm. So biofilm is a community of microorganisms. So you can see the in the picture in the background, you may have one or two cells on their own, or you may have these big communities and three dimensional structures that are really hard and stuck onto a surface. So we really need to make sure that we're controlling microbes so that we don't end up in scenarios like this because um, it makes it harder to kill. And then we, we run that risk of, of touch contamination and some of those problems. So lots of reasons why we want antimicrobial surfaces. And we have them in the real world now. They are everywhere, um, mostly due, I think, or, or most recently due to the pandemic, we are seeing a lot more interest in antimicrobial surfaces. A lot of the public are now aware that this is something that they want to see. Um, it gives people confidence to go out and about. Uh, and people are generally more aware now of sanitation and, and clean environments because of the last few years. So, so we are starting to see these materials um, come out into the real world. So on the left is a photo of an advertisement 
on the uh, metro in Vancouver in Canada. So they've rolled out copper surfaces into their into their metro lines um, for this exact purpose. Uh, I, but the problem that we see is that really what we want to be able to do is um, we want to be able to test these antimicrobial surfaces uh, in, in like realistic conditions. So at the moment, the challenge we've got is that we have test methods that we can use in the lab to test antimicrobial materials, metal materials, whatever they may be, and we can generate data from there. Um, that means that we can say with confidence that these things work, that they are antimicrobial. But really, those test methods are not at all realistic to any condition that you might want to put these materials into. So what we really need is to be able to test antimicrobial coatings and surfaces and um, biocide containing products uh, in environments or conditions that are expected for their intended end use. So if you want to place a copper handrail in a metro train, then we want to be able to test it in the lab in a condition that's similar to make sure that the test method itself is not artificially providing um, data that suggests something is antimicrobial when perhaps it might not be um, as good as we would like it to be. Uh, and then this problem is made worse when you think about um, actually how these things are used in the real world. Of course, when we are testing things in the lab, they are in lab conditions and that's really important because we need things to be reproducible um, and we need control over things in the lab. But when you go out into the real world, nothing is um, quite the same. And even, even down to the point of saying, OK, well, a train, for example, um, a metro train might have a particular type of environment. But that metro train in Canada is going to be quite different to one that you might find in the UK or in Spain or wherever it might be. So we need to think very carefully about how people are using these materials. So where it is, what type of material it is some things about environmental factors, which I'll talk about in a moment. So temperature, airflow, humidity, and then, you know, all the local and variable factors. So how often are things cleaned? How are they disinfected? What are they, what are they disinfected with? Um, all of those things will go into assessing how an antimicrobial surface actually works and if it is actually efficacious in its intended end use. So it is a very complex, um, problem when you think about trying to make a method that is realistic to an intended end use. So that really is what we're trying to achieve. We want a method that we can say, okay, if you've got an antimicrobial copper surface and you want to put it into a train, here's what you need to do to demonstrate that it, it, it works. As we've heard, hand contact is one of the big challenges. Um, and that's because it's something that is often touched often. So a metro, a train metro, for example, you might have thousands of people touching a handrail every hour. Um, and each of these people will have different microbes on their hand. And they'll also have other contaminating factors. So they may have just been eating food and have grease on their hands, or they may, it may be raining outside and their hands may be wet. It may be very sunny and their hands may be dry. Um, and all of these things will change how well those materials work. And the key thing for us at the moment is that most, the vast majority of antimicrobial coatings and materials, particularly things with nanometals in and uh, biocide releasing agents and photocatalytic materials, require moisture to be active. Okay, there needs to be uh, moisture around for those materials to leach out into where it will get to the microorganisms and, and destroy the microorganisms. Um, the way it does that, we just had a really nice example of some of those, those um, things with the, the last technology that we just heard about. But generally, um, these, uh, so this is an example of copper. So if you've got a copper surface and you've got a bug on top of it with some moisture there, those copper ions are going to leach out of that material. They're going to interact with that microorganism. It's going to cause lots of damage in lots of different ways. And essentially it will kill um, the bacteria and make it non-viable. And for the majority of scenarios, the same happens with viruses as well. Viruses aren't alive, so there's less to destroy, um, but, they, but they will inactivate a virus uh, relatively easily also. But as I say, the problem for us is that um, when we are testing things in the lab, 
uh, they are not at all realistic. And so we've, we've got a concern as to whether there is a disconnect between lab data, the data that we are generating to demonstrate efficacy and how well these materials might work when we get them into the real world. So at the moment, um, ISO 22196 uh, and GIS Z2801. If anybody in the Zoom is a common tester of antimicrobial materials, these are probably quite um, well known to you. These are the most commonly used antimicrobial test method um, methods that are out there. They are ISO standards, so they are um, well adapted, well used in the world, um, and have a lot of people generating data using them. They're relatively easy to do, quite straightforward, not very difficult. Uh, but there are some limitations that it's really, really important that we understand what that means when we're using data from this method to uh, demonstrate efficacy. So there are a couple of issues with this, and I won't go into too much detail, but what I would um, draw your attention to is the second bullet point on the left, which is temperature of 35 plus or minus one degree Celsius with a relative humidity of not less than 90%. Um, and the test has to run for about 24 hours, 24 plus or minus one hour. Now, they are the test conditions for this method. Um, and if you think about pretty much any application of an antimicrobial surface, it's highly unlikely, I would say, that you're going to put a material in conditions that look like this, um, where you are expecting a 24 hour uh, touch type scenario. So most temperatures in the world around us, the built environment are much lower than 35 plus or minus one. You're much more likely to be, you know, 14 to maybe 20, um, depending on where you are. Uh, humidity, certainly not 90%, would be a very uncomfortable place to be. Uh, you're probably looking more close to somewhere between 40 and 60%. And certainly, in terms of how long to leave microorganisms on a surface, 24 hours is a very, very long time. So if you leave a microbe on a surface that is even a little bit antimicrobial, if you leave it for 24 hours, you're likely to see a significant uh, decrease in numbers. Um, but of course, if you're in the metro in Canada, then you want to know that that action is much quicker than 24 hours because for you as a user of the, of the service, um, actually, knowing something dies in 24 hours is not that useful to us. We need to know kind of what the limitations are there and how quick these things work. So, um, and you can just see on the right, so some UK information, um, but it will be similar, I'm sure, any, in other places. Well, hospital wards are often between 30 and 60% relative humidity, temperature between 18 and 24 to, uh, 28 degrees Celsius. Um, and equally with airflow, okay, so, these in 22196, the common method, we often, um, well, in fact, you, you put them in a chamber, right? So you need to make sure that the humidity doesn't drop below 90%. You have to close everything into a box. So there's no natural airflow. Um, and that means that everything stays really wet. Okay, the surface stays really, really wet the whole time. And if your antimicrobial surface requires moisture to be active, it's going to be wet for 24 hours and it's going to work. Okay, so what we want to do is develop an approach um, and an awareness that we need to be using other, other approaches to testing antimicrobial efficacy because they are poor simulations of in-use conditions. They, they don't really work. As an initial screen, they are fantastic. So it's really useful for us to use this method to know if something works. But then when you want to know if it's going to work in a particular location, we need to think a little bit more carefully about what what kind of tests we are doing. So we've been working for the last couple of years on developing a 3D printed test chamber for this purpose. Um, each of the components in this uh, are, you can buy everything you need from Amazon. Um, and as I say, the actual chamber itself is 3D printed. So um, it's really reproducible. And the whole point is that we can control things like airflow, we can control humidity, we can control um, how many samples go in and how long it takes, um, and then also temperature as well. So we're moving towards the process of uh, a new method that can start to bring some of those environmental conditions into, into more useful um, parameters, because as I say, I keep coming back to the idea that 
these materials need to be wet to be active. And so if your test artificially keeps everything wet for 24 hours, then what you're doing is giving a, a antimicrobial surface the very best chance to demonstrate that it's going to work, not um, the best chance to demonstrate it's going to work in your intended end use. So we're, we're currently working towards um, trying to make this a viable test chamber that anybody can use um, and will be published and available, freely available, uh, as part of a standardized method. Um, but as you can tell, uh, when you're thinking about things like temperature, humidity and airflow, um, it's, these things are really quite complex and, and they're really, really hard to model, uh, but we are slowly working our way through it. So you can see, so I'd, if you, um, on the previous slides, the, the writing in red in the corner are where we publish some of this work. So you can always go back and look at some of this stuff in the literature if you would like. Um, and there's a lot of numbers on the page right now. So I'm not going to kind of take you through each of them one by one. Um, that wouldn't be very fun. So instead, I'll just give you some highlights. But essentially what we did here, because that the amount of time moisture is on a surface is really important for you to know how active your material is. Um, we actually just pipetted small droplets of water onto surfaces um, and seen how long it takes to dry. Okay, so if our method takes 24 hours, and we know that's not very realistic. How long should we be keeping droplets of water on surfaces for? What does it look like in reality? And how do these temperature, humidity, and airflow, um, how do they interact with these kinds of times? And as you can imagine, the warmer a condition, um, the quicker it's going to take to dry. Okay, so that makes sense, doesn't it? So if something is really warm, your droplet is going to dry quicker. Um, if the humidity is high, it's going to take longer to dry. If there's more moisture in the air around you, it's going to take longer for droplets to dry on a surface. And this is important because the 22196 standard method keeps things at 100% humidity, and therefore you are likely not to see any drying, which will artificially increase the amount of antimicrobial action compared to um, in, in use conditions for most, most um, uses. So what, we, what we're looking to do is drop that humidity down to something that's, that's more realistic, which means the droplets will dry, and that might be a problem for a lot of antimicrobial surfaces, but we will see. Um, and then including airflow, because there is nowhere in the world that has no airflow um, for most antimicrobial surfaces. Any room you have, any public transport, any, any sort of environment is gonna have a, mo a movement of air in there, and any sort of airflow increases um, means that droplets are going to dry quicker as well. Okay, so if the if the amount of time a droplet with bacteria or viruses on a surface is important to your antimicrobial action, and as I say, for most antimicrobial surfaces with biocides or nanomaterials or whatever that might be, that often is the case. Then we really need to think about things like uh, humidity, temperature, and airflow very very carefully. It's not, not useful to us to just say it works in 24 hours in these really um, artificial conditions. We really need to understand what is happening in conditions that are much more realistic. Um, we've also played around with different types of microorganisms. Uh, and so what you can see here are um, the colors, the little color bars are different liquids. So water, SM buffer and saline are all controls. So there's no microbes in those. But then we've got Pseudomonas syringae and E. coli as two bacteria, and then Phi174 and Phi6, which are viruses. And essentially, we dropped these onto um, different types of materials, polypropylene, nitrile, PVC, and copper, and we see how long it takes to dry. Okay, And what you can see is that actually in all scenarios where, there was a, where the bacteria were involved, those droplets dried significantly quicker. Um, and depending on the material it is and the type of microorganism, it varied quite a lot. Okay, so when we're making claims around antimicrobial surfaces and that they work, we really, really need to think very carefully about the data that's been presented there and what that might look like when you transfer it into the real world. Unfortunately, these things are very complex um, and uh, we've still got a lot more work to go to, to really untangle what's happening here. Um, and then we need to think about what happens when the bacteria land on the surface, on your surface, wherever that might be. 
Um, and so what you can see here is the same bacteria dropped onto different types of material. So again, polypropylene, nitrile, PVC, and copper in that order. Uh, and you can see, you, you might be able to see, depending on how big your screen is, the kind of pattern of deposition of bacteria. You can't really see them very well. Um, if you follow the um, manuscript in, in the bottom left corner there, you'll be able to find these images in a, a much clearer vision. But you can see them a little bit better in this one. Um, and so we need, to, and we, I, we, I mean, me, we as microbiologists really need to understand what's happening in these droplets. So, because it's important that if your surface, um, it, what, what you want is a, a nice even layer of your contaminating bacteria on your surface. So your surface can, can kill those bacteria. If they start to drop on top of each other and pile up on top of each other, then it might be that your antimicrobial action doesn't really reach the top of the bacterial pile. Um, so we need to understand a little bit more about how the bacteria uh, and other microorganisms deposit onto, onto such surfaces. So again, on the left, we've got polypropylene, and then on the right, we've got copper. And you can see on the left, we see a phenomenon that's known as the coffee ring effect. So we, we have a, a deposition of bacteria around the outer edge. I don't know whether you can see my mouse or not, but we we'll talk about here. Um, so we get a deposition here, then we get this uh, cleared zone, and then we get a nice even layer of bacteria here. But this deposition around the edge, they are they are actually piled on top of each other. They aren't nice and, and uh, laid out, and that might cause problems depending on uh, the type of antimicrobial action. Whereas on this pure copper surface, we don't see that effect. We just see a nice even distribution of bacteria. So not only is it important to understand the environmental conditions that you're placing your materials into, but also the interaction between the microbe um, and the surface as well uh, when we get into the real world. So essentially, um, what I don't have for you is a nice easy answer in terms of how we do this. Uh, but what we do now know is that we've got lots of work to do to create these methods. And we're seeing a lot of conversation in the industry um, and with colleagues in other sectors as well. So the US and, and other places that are really interested in this kind of um, work, because we're, we are getting to the position now where we understand that the standardized test methods that we have to use anti, for antimicrobial testing might not be um, all we need. So they are very, very useful. They are absolutely are useful and they do a really good job, but we might need, for example, a second set of methods that are more finely tuned to some of these common end use environments, touch surfaces, transport, hospitals, all those kinds of things. And it's really, really important that when we're designing these methods, um, we make them usable, reproducible, repeatable, uh, all the things that you'd expect from an ISO method, for example, um, and also is understandable, I guess, for the end user and the manufacturer as well. So essentially what we've been working on for a little while now is, uh, as I say, developing chambers and different approaches and trying to understand the background of the interaction between a microbial and antimicrobial surface in a, an end use environment. And we've actually just started a project uh, via Horizon Europe um, with partners from nine countries for, across 14 institutions uh, called NOVA, so Next Generation Bioactive Nanocoatings. Um, and my role in this is to develop methods like this, it's exactly this reason, um, to really try to push the boundaries with uh, you know, developing approaches so we understand how these things work. Um, but it's, it's exceptionally complex, it is really complex because as I say, I've got four, four kind of uh, ideas there, mobile phone. So we, we want to look at touch screens, we want to look at textiles, we want to look at the hospital environment, and we want to look at the inside of aircraft. And each of those have so much variation in terms of their environment. So it really is a, 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 an interesting and quite challenging thing, but we are committed to try and understand what's happening here. Um, and I, I think, you know, most industry partners that I, I talk to about this agree that there is a lack of methods that are realistic. And this is something that we know that, for example, the BPR are really keen to see. Um, how do we know that these things work? OK, uh, and how do we, how can you demonstrate when we know the methods that we've got aren't really as useful as they as they could be?
So that's just started. So hopefully uh, more to come from me on this over the next few years. Um, and, and with that, really, I think I will finish there. And if there's any questions, then, then um, I'm sure that's fine. We can take those. Um, but I would just point out the collaborators, of course, none of these things are done in, uh, certainly not just done by me. Um, and yeah, really interested to, to hear what people have got to, to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, I agree, it was a really interesting presentation. So I'll uh, just put on my general placeholder slide. Voila. And so I see that somebody was already very quick out of the gate. Uh, I have copy pasted their questions into the chat. So I think we can uh, start with those right away. So for James, um, so the first question is, uh, could you please comment on the possibility of lower relative humidity defined as less than 60% on this second set of methods to kill the test specimens? And the second question, do you believe that the initial load of bacteria proposed by the standards are good enough to simulate an exaggeration for the bacterial load in actual reality surfaces? Um, the questions are also in the chat if you want to have them at hand. Great. So yeah, so it's interesting. These are the questions that we really need to get to. So um, I think dropping humidity is really important. That's something we spend a lot of time modeling using different humidities uh, because it all links back to how those droplets behave and how the bacteria land and how quickly they dry. So we are going through a process at the moment of um, testing lots of different humidities to see what happens. Uh, but it comes down to, for me, um, modeling that end use right so that might not mean that if you know that your intended environment has a humidity of 50 percent that might not actually translate to 50 percent in the lab what we would like to see is that if you know in your intended end use you have a humidity of 50 percent and what that means is it takes a contaminating droplet six minutes to dry for example on your surface what we want to be able to do is emulate that six minute drying time in our lab condition so it might be that our environmental factors are different but essentially that time to drying is is what we think is really important because that is what's going to trigger the activity on the antimicrobial surface so there's a lot to think about there uh, in terms of the initial load of bacteria so that the challenge then becomes that um we need to put enough on that we can see the difference after the test. So we need to artificially increase the load because we need to be able to recover them from your controls and, and know that they've they've died or, or whatever might have happened there. Um, but in reality, you know, a droplet of 10 to 3, 10 to the 4 uh, in whatever it might be, might not be what we're expecting, particularly if it's a touch surface um, or like a you know, uh, not a hospital setting, for example, you know. Um, so there's a lot to think about there as well, because how do we know if the surface has worked if we only put a small number of bacteria on? And then also, how do we know if we put lots on that we're going to see the same type of activity if only a small, small contaminating um, droplet attaches? So these are the questions that um, we're, we're trying to uncover at the moment. So as I say, I think a lot of people are thinking about these things. Um, and we yeah we just need to kind of get everyone everyone's minds together to come up with a, a way forward. Yeah, thank you, James. So um, again, if you would like to ask a question, you can either uh, type it in the chat or raise a virtual hand. I think Blanca has just now. You can go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, yes, uh, very interesting presentations, both of them. I have a question for each. Um, <clears throat> now, since James is there online, uh, maybe I can ask you first. Um, um, when I'm looking at, uh, uh, mainly my experience comes from the medical device sector. And when we use disinfectants, we also have to test that the surface is not damaged um, by using that particular disinfectant. Do you envisage also uh, standards on that front or are you contributed to any of that? Yeah, so medical devices is uh, even more complex because of the added regulatory um, issues. So we are, um, at the moment, we're looking at medical devices from a biofilm 
perspective, so anti-biofilm, antimicrobial claims. Um, but it's, yeah, much, much, much harder. I think one of the things that we also don't really think about when we think about antimicrobial surfaces is how long they're going to last for. Um, if they leach all of their, you know, how long do they last? With methods like 22196, we are using pristine surfaces that have never been used before. So, for example, should we be using aged, artificially aged samples? Should we be looking at um, also running alongside durability assessment? Because um, all of these things will affect antimicrobial surfaces. Uh, but yes, yeah, essentially, even more complex. As I say, I'm, I'm only really involved in medical devices from a biofilm point of view, not necessarily um, disinfectants and li especially liquid disinfectants, I guess. Um, but I, I appreciate it's a, it's a complex problem. Yeah, exactly. But okay, so this is a very difficult case. I suppose that you don't want to start there, right? <laughs> you want to start on something easier. Yeah, yeah and, and also my question from Eldara, because she also mentioned medical devices. And one point, one question that she will be asked when she tries to put this forward in under medical devices is if she knows um, how long will this this metal particle stay on, on the surface of the catheter or whatever other devices? she she wants to to disinfect because the, generally we have to show that any trace of the disinfectant is disappeared from the surface of the medical device so in this case i think eldara you'll have to make sure that you 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 have a way of telling them that they are, your particles will be gone because if there are particles on the medical device then you you get into more problems but i don't know if you have thought about this Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First of all, this, this, is, this was preliminary results. So yeah. now we need to develop this uh, by the hand to a, uh, to a partner or a company that uh, do this. I mean, to find their issues and to put together all results. Uh, one thing is that the, these metal molecules interact with the polymer that form the catheter. So in principle, they are not going to diffuse. They are going to be to stay there and they are temperature stable. So we hope or we, we think that they will stay. They will not be they will not be released for the class uh, for the metal molecules to the outside of the catheter. But we should measure it. I mean, yeah. uh, we need to, to, to test everything. I mean, uh, the results that we have are really preliminary preliminary just with the with the um, with the compounds i mean uh, but this these are things that we should test uh, if we want to to apply but with somebody from the from the market i mean from the yes. from the market of the, of the catheters we, we are not able to test everything uh, by our own if we don't do not have demand I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a difficult thing because we, we have a lot of things that could be really interesting, but we need to focus, I mean, and find the, the, the specific partner. But I think that uh, is a, a good and interesting challenge, the thing with the catheters. I, I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, because the medical device regulation as opposed to reach is more exposure driven. Yes. So first, mm -hmm. I will ask you for the exposure of this. Yeah, yeah the release, no? The, the release, exposure, yeah, release, yeah, it's released. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then from there, you, you mm -hmm. go into the, the relevant route of exposure and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's a different approach to, to reach, which we're more used to. But yeah, interesting, yeah. No? Yeah, really but interesting. The, the interesting mm -hmm. thing with, with this mechanism and these molecules is that they are not they don't do not behave as particles that are embedded maybe in a polymer and they can diffuse. The idea is that they are attached with the different atoms or one of two of the atoms, the metal atoms to the to the polymer. So they are not supposed to be released. So I think that this is an interesting point uh, of using this. But yeah. yeah, of course, we should measure. <laughs> yeah, then you have to show them. <laughs> Great. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, see if there are any other questions. Uh, yes, Sean? Yeah, just a quick one to James. Are you actually looking uh, to 
sort of introduced new standards in this area or sort of moving towards new standards? Uh, yes. So um, we work with British standards and then also uh, a couple of the European SEND groups and, and various other people. So there's a lot, there is a lot of work going on in, around this at the moment in terms of standardization. Um, it's just that everybody's running up against these same challenges and uh, and the challenge the, the, the problem is there's a lot of basic biology that we need to understand properly to kind of make sure that we're doing this right but it's, it is on the way so there are a couple of um proposed standards knocking around at the moment and i assume they'll they'll pop up in the next couple of years uh, but yeah there's there's a lot out there that's happening and and just as quickly as a follow-up is is there any discrepancy between the sort of uh standards or standards that are there for coatings and maybe regulation as well um well the chat i think so part of the problem is especially with the bpr and the some of the us regulators as well that they now appreciate that our current methods especially 22196 which is the most used method isn't doing what people had hoped it was doing in that it, it's not really a very good measure of end use activity and uh, if the regulator wants to see end use activity in there you know to, to, to go about their business and, and, and regulate um, the materials and you know allow people to use antimicrobial claims um, then yeah they, they know that they don't work very well and so the onus is on the manufacturer to demonstrate that actually they can demonstrate efficacy in these um, the end use efficacy. And that's really, really hard because we haven't got the standards. Right. So um, this is part of it. It's a, it's a it's a kind of bit of a stalemate, I guess, in that um, we haven't got that scenario in the US. They the regulators work quite quite well with people to develop methods and really input into those conversations and that doesn't really happen so much here so um you know instead we we as academics and industry partners have to really push this stuff forward but it's you know people are definitely aware of this as a problem and there is a lot of work going on out there to, to try and push this forward thank you so um I'm looking at the chat. All right. I hope we haven't frightened everyone into not taking public transport ever again. Um, all right, if there are no more questions, uh, I, I just want to remind you if there is anything else you would like, if you have any follow up questions after the event, you will receive the slides, you have our contact details, so don't hesitate to uh, reach out. Um, then uh, all that's left for me to do is thank once again, uh, Eldara and James uh, for their presentations and you all for your participation. I will just leave you with a brief teaser of our next uh, webinar that is going to be most likely on the 24th of April, but more information will be on the NIA website and LinkedIn channel. Uh, and also ask you for five minutes of your time if you can uh, fill in the, the, the re reply to the literally three questions of the survey on today's event uh, so that we can keep uh, making these webinars relevant on, on topics that are important to you and your organizations. So um, Nicolene, if you could perhaps maybe just uh, copy paste the link into the chat, people will already have it. And if not, uh, I will also send it with the slides uh, later on. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank you all again and wish you a very good rest of day or afternoon and uh, hope to speak to all of you in April. Thank you very much.